We're going to start looking at some of these specific elements that we're going to play with a lot, not the least of which is carbon. Carbon is the most important atom. Oh, that's tough, right? Which is your most important organ in your body? Can you pick one? Can you pick the most important organ in your body? Huh? The brain. Okay. Can you live without your heart? No. So is heart. You you see, it's, it's tough to just pick out one. So uh, carbon is a very important atom. Scratch out most, but very important atom that we're going to play with. One of the reasons why it is so useful (coughs) in the foundation of our organic molecules is because carbon has a valence of four. What in the world does that mean? Carbon has a valence of four. It needs four electrons for that outermost shell. So with a valence of four, think, think of oxygen. What, what valence did ox, does oxygen have? Two. Because it needs two more electrons. That's why it's... How many does it need to complete that outer shell? So that's why we have H2O. So for carbon with a valence of four, it can share electrons with four other elements, four other atoms. And when you share electrons, what kind of bonds do we use to share electrons? Covalent. I'm going to repeat stuff a lot. That's how we learn it. So valence is how many it needs, not how many it Yes, yes. So since we can add four more, we can form four bonds we can do that with oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, the sulfur. Those are the most common. And we're going to see other groups that we can bond to these and build these complex molecules. Now, carbon can also form these single covalent bonds. You notice how we start real simple and then we get more complex? Well, you can also share more than one electron with the two atoms and form a double bond. Or you can share three to form a triple bond. When you look at single sharing one, double sharing two, triple sharing three, what what do you think is going to happen with the strength of the bonds as you share more and more electrons? Stronger and stronger. That is part of what's happening here. We see carbon. We're going to share with four hydrogens. Complete that outermost shell. We're going to form an organic molecule called methane. It's a hydrocarbon. You see why we call them hydrocarbons? Because that's all there is. Ethanol, methylene, all of these are hydrocarbons. You might throw an oxygen in there every now and then. Here we have our double bonds, ethylene, carbon dioxide. We got oxygen and carbon sharing. Carbon is the big, big brother. Oxygen's big brother to hydrogen. You've ever have you got any middle middle kids in here? Okay, do you ever get forgotten? You're the middle kid. Why we're not even listening to you, right? <laughs> so, so think of oxygen as the middle brother. Carbon's the big big brother, and it's going to share those electrons. Then we get down with nitrogen. You can get those triple bonds, right? More electrons, more bonds, stronger the covalency between those two atoms. And when we look at the strength of the bonds, we're going to look at the energies that are present in these bonds. And when we look at non-covalent bonds, what would be a non-covalent bond? Not not a specific example. What other bonds? Ionic. Ionic. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. So non-covalent are down here because remember we said covalent bond was like concrete. It's the strongest. And our covalent bonds are going to be the highest energy of our bonds. And when we measure energies, a lot of times we put that in the term of wavelengths. And so we have ultraviolet. There's our visible light, infrared, and microwave energies. The higher energy is going to be on the side of ultraviolet. And so when we have some of these single bonds... 
when we subject them to ultraviolet light, very high energy, what happens to the bond? If you break apart some of these bonds in protein, if you break apart some of these bonds in DNA, what possibly have you created in some of your cells? Mutations. Mutations are the first step to what horrible disease? Cancer. Where does ultraviolet light for us come from? You following my logic here, folks? So when you see all those people out at the pool or in those tanning beds toasting themselves, they're breaking chemical bonds that could potentially lead to cancer. We like, we like if, if someone told you, if you do this, you'll get cancer, we, we probably would try to avoid some of that, most of that. Well, we can't really stay out of the sun, but we can certainly protect ourselves from the damage that possibly is going to happen. So here again, we have our wavelengths of light, and we look at the energies required to break our chemical bonds. There's a single carbon-nitrogen, carbon-carbon, which is going to be one of the most common in our bodies, and in hydrocarbon molecules. And then here we have a carbon-hydrogen bond. <coughs> and as we look... Our carbon-carbon bonds are going to require quite a bit of energy to break. In fact, we're going to have to get upwards of 95 kilocalories per mole. So in this neighborhood, and look at our wavelength, 300. So that's going to put us down in this range. So that means under our visible light conditions, most of which we have here on Earth, we're not breaking down our organic bonds, which is a good thing. We're really going to have to expose ourselves to these high-energy ultraviolet rays before we do damage. Now, don't go out and say, well, Dr. Langford said I could, that it was safe. Okay? No. Just because you're not breaking bonds with a microwave doesn't mean you need to stick your hand in it. Okay? I think we all would say, let's not do that you're going to do other damage in a microwave. So as we look at our carbons and hydrocarbons, one of the big things about hydrocarbon molecules is they are insoluble in water. Does that surprise anyone? So when we're putting our hydrocarbon into the gas tank of our cars, is that exactly how that stuff came out of the ground? How, what, what shape is it in when it comes out of the ground? What, what are we pumping out of the ground before we go refine it and make gasoline? Oil. Oil. Oil is a hydrocarbon. Oil is a mixture of all different kinds of hydrocarbons. What we're trying to pull out to put in our gas tank of our car is an eight carbon hydrocarbon. And guess what its name is with eight carbons? octane. You know those numbers? Those, that's the percentage of octane in that mixture you're putting in your gas tank. But it comes out as oil. Oil is a hydrocarbon. And what have we learned since elementary school about oil and water? They don't mix. Why? Because hydrocarbons are insoluble in water. Wait a minute, dude. You said water was the universal solvent just yesterday. Meaning water can dissolve anything, almost anything. And water's great at doing that because what kind of covalent bonds hold the hydrogen and oxygen together in water? Hmm? Polar covalent bonds. It's charged. You're going to have and be able to establish these hydrogen bonds with a lot of different things. And we're going to look at sodium chloride as an example. But look at hydrocarbons. They have carbons and hydrogens. What charge do hydrocarbons have? None. No, 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 that's a covalent bond. Hydrocarbons are all bonded together. This would be an example of what we're going to see hydrocarbons being not polar, they're not charged, they can't interact with water. And so molecules 
that are not polar and not charged that don't interact with water are said to be hydro water phobic, afraid of. I don't know why they put phobic. They just can't mix them. So call them hydrophobic. And so our hydrocarbons are hydrophobic, insoluble in water. You can try to mix them up, but over time, what's it'll do? It'll still just separate out. The hydrocarbons stay with hydrocarbons, primarily because there's no water. Just as a freebie here, those interactions between hydrocarbons, because the water's not there, are called von Wander uh, van der Waals forces, just simply because water's not there. So insoluble in water simply because we've got the hydrogen and carbons and no charge. Now we're going to talk about phospholipids and all of our membranes that are going to have a lot of these hydrophobic hydrocarbons, but they have another part too that's going to be really, really important. No, don't be sorry. Does the water doesn't connect? Is it because of all the electrons are used up? There's just nothing. Yeah, to grab? because you've got electrons and protons hanging on to each other, being shared between the carbon and the hydrogen. There's, there's nothing, nothing else to share it with. And there's no unequal sharing, so there's no slightly positive, slightly negative. So there's our hydrocarbon. And when we talk about the phospholipids over here on the right, whenever you see all these carbons and hydrogens and carbons and hydrogens, either single or double bonded, yeah, this whole part that you see in gray, hydrophobic. No charge, not polar. It's not going to interact with water. But for our membranes of our cells, where the organelles are the plasma membrane, you also have this part that's stuck on top and attached to the chains, which creates a part of this overall molecule that is what? Polar. It will then, if it's a polar molecule, what's it going to interact with? Water. So your plasma membrane, and we're going to, you're going to know way too much about plasma membrane when we finish, but your membranes are composed of two layers of phospholipids. All of these gray hydrocarbon chains are pointing in toward each other. The polar regions are out here in the green and the reds and the purples. They're on the outside. This would be on the inside toward the cytoplasm of the cell. And guess what can associate with them? What's all that blue? Water. So you've got a layer, like an Oreo cookie. I love Oreos. You'll hear me talk about them the whole semester. I love Oreo cookie analogies. So your Oreo cookie, the cookie part, is soluble in, I'm not going to say water, because you've got to use milk. It's soluble in milk. It's kind of like water. But the cookie part, the stuff in the middle, that part isn't soluble. It's insoluble. So that aspect is going to help the membrane to be selectively permeable and decide what can pass through it and what can't. But the whole package of the cell is completely soluble in water. And the inside cytoplasm of the cell is going to be soluble in water. It's simply the envelope is waterproof. Loose, let me just loosely say that now. We'll make it more complex, but just right now, the whole package of the cell, because this layer, consider it waterproof. It's not really, but we'll consider it that way to start with. Make sense? So that's carbon. What else can we do with carbon? Well, we can add some oxygens. Uh, we can uh, arrange them in different ways so that we get these what we call functional groups. We're, we're going to start to build more and more complex molecules that we're going to assemble into sugars and proteins and nucleic acids. So we're going to have a carboxyl group and we're going to have a phosphate group. The structures of these aren't as important to me as a biologist and really interested in biochemistry and molecular biology. But the thing that I want you to remember more than the structure, is its property. These groups are negatively charged. 
Will those groups and molecules containing those groups be soluble in water? Yes, they're charged. Charged or polar will. Here we have an amine group. We'll see these in our amino acids. A nitrogen and three hydrogens. Positively charged. Is it water soluble? Yes, because it's charged. To a lesser degree, we have these neutral, hydroxyl, sulfhydryl, carbonyl, and aldehyde. These are neutral, but what else do we have along with it? Is that water soluble? Yeah. So really, our hydrocarbons are one of the main groups of biological molecules because they're not polar and they're not charged. They are hydro. Phobic, fearing, hydrophobic. No, go ahead and say, if you start learning it that way and put the word with it, that's great. Because the test isn't until Tuesday. But if you already know that now, almost a, a week ahead of time, that's great. Don't you want to have to study less the night before? Yeah, you shouldn't be studying a ton the night before. You should have your studying done before then. Now, this, this is starting to get into the weeds here. Because with carbon having four bonds, you can create molecules that are different but look very, very similar. Is that confusing? That are very similar but look different. Can you describe a situation where you have something and you all have this something. And you have two of them that looks very similar, but they're different. Eyes is one, yeah. Fingerprints. Are your hands different? Are your hands different? They're mirror images of each other. Because here, what side of my hand is my thumb on? Right. What? It's pointing in. We'll do it that way, right? But it's pointing toward the right. Which way is this hand thumb going? If my thumb was coming out over here, that would look weird. So, so do you see? Mirror images. They look identical, but they're flipped. It's like uh, Alice in the looking glass, the mirror image. Well, that can happen with our molecules. And in particular, we see it with amino acids that have four groups that they can stick onto the carbon right here in the middle. And so a system was devised so that we can determine the handedness of a particular molecule. So here we have a molecule looking in the mirror. This is the stereoisomer of this molecule. It's mirror image reflection. Now the old system we used D for right and L for left. And again I like to memorize half as much and just know the other's the opposite. So D and L was easy. L was left and D was the other one which is right. Well the new system they've changed it. Now R is for right and S is for left. What the heck? Why don't they just go R for right, L for left? That would make more sense. But no, we've we got to make it hard. Why in the world would you put S ever with left? Back then they used to think that being left-handed was a bad thing. It's sinister. Yeah, they used, to, they used to think that people were left-handed were evil. Sinister. Because it's not normal. But where do we know S and left-handed? Southpaw. Southpaw. I mean, it's used a lot in the boxing world or a lot of times you'll hear it in the baseball world. A left-handed pitcher. Southpaw S. So again, you can remember R for right and S is the other one. So that's the nomenclature. But when we look, for instance, at amino acids, <coughs> one way we can distinguish it is with the acronym CORN. Carbon, oxygen, the side group that is changeable of amino acids, and you just need to know it is R right now. And then the nitrogen of the amine group. If you see the R group and the amine group and you read them going counterclockwise, that's going to be left. 
if you read the R group and the N group and it's going clockwise, that's going to be right-handed. Now, which, which is which here? That's tough to see. And, and by the way, I'm not going to have you decipher a picture like this on the test. I need you to understand the directionality. So let's flatten it out. So here's our amine group. And so if our amine group, and this is our carboxyl group, so here, oh, I'm sorry, that's the carboxyl with the O. So that's the O. So here is our O group. There's our side group. There's our amine group. So this is going to be our L or S sinister. And this is going to be our right-handed, which old way is D or R. The big thing that I want you to remember from all of this in stereoisomers, for amino acids in particular, the L form, the S form, the left-handedness, that's going to be the form that's assembled into proteins, naturally occurring. And so with stereoisomers, the left-handed one, that's the one that we're going to use in nature to assemble into proteins. But just understand they can't exist in these different mirror image configurations. All right. So now let's get back to water. We talked about water. So in our discussion of water, we know it's polar, polar covalent. We know water molecules are cohesive because they have the hydrogen bonds that bond them together. We've already talked about it being a great solvent. Do we need to go over hydrophobic, hydrophilic? Oil and water doesn't mix because oil's not polar or charged. Hydrophilic, when you have those groups like we saw, negative or positive or polar, they're going to interact with water. And so it's going to be great universal solvent at dissolving things. But we also see that water is going to have a tremendous ability to be a temperature buffer. Water is not going to heat up quickly. What's the saying about a watched pot? Never boils. Never boils. Why? Because it takes a while to heat up. Likewise, if you've got heated water, it's not going to cool down very quickly either. Water has a tremendous temperature stabilizing capacity, and that's the configuration of the water as well as the bonds between water molecules. Hydrogen bonding, we've got that right. Between polar covalent molecules, those opposite attractive forces can hold those water molecules together. And understand, in your bottle of water right now, water's not just sitting there doing nothing. It's, it's continually doing this. Those hydrogen bonds, are those the weaker or the stronger of our bonds? They're the weakest. So they're continually breaking, continually reforming. But this is not happening at room temperature water so quickly that we get steam. When we put that much heat energy into a solution of water, it's going to break all of these and the molecules are moving around so fast, whew, that's where we get the steam from. So the hydrogen bonds accounts for much, if not all, of the properties of water. And again, we've got the hydrogen bonds because of the polar covalent bond between the oxygen and hydrogen. So in ice, is it still moving? It's just really slow, or does it stop? What do you think? I mean, it's an excellent question. When you see ice, and you look at that cube of ice, is it moving? Yeah. It is, just really, really slowly. All right. Now, I, I guess you would stop water molecules moving. I guess, would that happen at absolute zero? Yeah. You'd have to get really, really cold to stop it all. Huh? I'm sure there's some geeky scientist out there that has, has gotten water molecules down to absolute zero. I don't know. Maybe on Big Bang Theory. I don't know. I've not done it personally. Um, you know, this is really just repeating what we've already said. 
And again, in the previous illustration where you saw the breaking and the forming of bonds, understand that's going to be microseconds. Not milliseconds, micro. Remember, milli is a thousandth of a second, micro is a thousandth of a... Yeah, so quickly that's going to be happening. Have you ever seen this, this little guy? This is a, a water bug, a water strider. How in the world is it walking on the surface of the water? I've only heard of one person that could walk on water, but, you know, yeah, this, this, is, this is not that particular instance. How in the world is this happening? The water molecules, those hydrogen bonds of water, is stronger than the weight of this little critter pushing downward. It has hairs on its legs, and I would wager that substance on the hairs that is hydro, what? Phobic. So it's like these little oily feet that can't push through the hydrogen bonds of water, so it just walks on the water. That's pretty cool, huh? Doesn't relate to you in any way, shape, or form, but that's pretty cool. But surface tension of water is absolutely critical for you. Because we talked yesterday about babies, right? Did we mention? No, this was in my, my camp class. So for nine months, when you were in your mother's womb, what were you breathing? When you were, before you were born, what were you breathing? Was it air? Uh uh. What were you breathing? Amniotic fluid, which is mostly water. You breathed water for nine months. Isn't that kind of scary? You breathed water for nine months. You were originally like a. There was a time where you looked like you kind of had gills, but they really weren't gills. They were just slits, pharyngeal slits. You're getting the oxygen from mom and the placenta. But here's the thing when they cut that umbilical cord, how long do you have to start breathing? Air. That long. And you've got to clear this fluid out of your lungs. Now, we're mostly water. So you're going to have water your entire life in and around the cells of your lungs. And there are these little bitty tiny air spaces in your lungs called alveoli. They're half a micron in diameter. I can't make my hand that small. And they're coated with water. And the surface tensional forces, have you ever seen astronauts in the space station, they'll spit out like a little drop of water or squeeze it out a little? It wants to be a round sphere, right? The hydrogen bonds want to pull the water molecules into a perfect round spherical structure. So in your body, the water inside these little tiny alveoli, the water molecules are close enough that they want to pull together into a sphere, and they're strong enough to take these little alveoli and collapse them down. And if those alveoli are collapsed, you're never going to get air there, and you're never going to get oxygen into your blood. So, how in the world do you breathe? You have cells inside your lungs that make what kind of molecule hydrocarbons hydrophobic but the other part is going to have a polar group it's kind of like phospholipids and those are going to interfere with the water molecules and get them all mixed up so they're never close enough to pull on each other so that your little air spaces can stay open so surface tension of water in those hydrogen bonds are absolutely critical but babies don't start making this solution called surfactant until after about 28, 29 weeks of gestation. Now, why is that important? Why is that timing important? Do all babies go to 40 weeks? If they're born before 40 weeks, what do we call them? Premies, premature babies. And if they're born before 28 weeks, and if they're born like in week 20, 22, you can put an oxygen mask on them all day long, but they're not going to make it because they don't have surfactant and they can't keep those little air spaces open. Now, if they're late enough, 
The docs can squirt some synthetic surfactant into their lungs and open it up. But if they're too early, you're not even going to have the little air spaces. I'm just trying to draw attention to the fact that, yeah, we're looking at a bug, but this stuff applies to you. You all counted on that phospholipid being produced so that you could breathe at a very, very early point in your life to break up those surface tensional forces of water. So we talked about temperature stability. One calorie, and we all hate calories, right? You just hate thinking about calories. But the definition of one calorie is the amount of energy it takes to increase water by one degree centigrade. So to increase it is one calorie. We also talked about boiling water, right? The heat of vaporization. It's when you convert liquid water into gas, when you boil it. But plants do a pretty good job of converting water into vapor. That's called transpiration. And we actually do that, and it's really cool because we don't have to boil anything. Evaporation. Aren't you glad evaporation happens, especially in the summer here in East Texas? How do you know when you've been out in the heat too long? What's one of the first, well, it's not one of the first, but it's a sort of a late warning sign that you are in trouble. When you stop sweating. Have you ever been outside and been so hot that you stopped sweating? It is a scary, scary place. Because you're used to being soaking wet, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm not sweating. Which is usually followed by, whoo, I don't feel so good. Which is usually followed by, poof, pass out. Evaporation. It is so critical in helping cool our bodies because that liquid on the surface of your skin, when it goes from liquid to a gaseous state, energy is released and it feels cool. And it helps cool your body down. So we said the polarity of water is important for it to be a solvent. We saw those functional groups that are either negative, positive, or polar. Makes sense, right? Most biological molecules are polar. And so the opposite of hydrofearing, phobic, would be what? Hydrophilic, water loving. Phileos is love. So most of our biological molecules are hydrophilic. And we're going to see some, like our phospholipids, our membrane, they're both. And when they're both, we are going to call them amphipathic. That word's coming up later. You don't have to write it down now. Amphipathic. What's an amphibian? Water and land. Part of its life cycle in the water, part on land. So amphipathic refers to molecules that have parts that are either hydrophobic in one place and another part's hydrophilic. That's a phospholipid. But again, we'll, we'll reinforce and, and talk about that down the road. Salt, sodium chloride, hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophilic. Now, wait a minute. Sodium and chloride, they come together. What bond holds sodium and chloride together? Ionic bond. Someone over here. What's the definition of an ionic bond? Uh, hmm? It's an exchange. One atom gained or lost an electron, and so did the other. And then they come together because of their charges. So sodium chloride, one's positive, one negative. When they come together, what are they? They're neutral. So if they're neutral, how are they hydrophilic? because of the polar nature of water. So here you have your negative chloride, you've got your positive sodium. Look what water's doing here to our salt. Water molecules come in. When you drop a big chunk of salt into water, look what the water molecules are doing. They're surrounding the chloride. They're surrounding the sodium. So they, the bonds, those hydrogen bonds between water and sodium and water and chloride overwhelm the ionic bonding nature between the sodium and chloride itself. 
And so it's ionizing the sodium chloride molecule into a sodium ion and a chloride ion, and it's creating what are called spheres of hydration. Again, just completely surrounding these ions. And isn't it cool that water can do it to either a positive or a negative molecule? Look at the orientation of our water here. There's our negative aspect with the oxygen, but over here for the chloride, which is negative, now we've got the positive hydrogens creating these spheres and separating them. Water, we kind of take water for granted, don't we? I mean, it's just water. It's water. I can remember growing up when I saw bottled water for the first time in the store. Like, what crazy person's ever going to buy a bottle of water? You can get out of the faucet. Water is so important. It's so versatile and super cool. All the things that water can do. Now, we've got a good idea about hydrophilic. And we talked about those hydrocarbons, those neutral molecules that aren't charged and they're not polar. So that leads us in to talk about our membranes as selectively permeable. All of our membranes, either for our organelles, which would include our nucleus and mitochondria, among others, our plasma membranes, they are composed of molecules called phospholipids. Now, our membranes have a lot of other stuff, but the number one component, as far as number of molecules, are going to be these phospholipids, often drawn with a big round portion, and these two chains, these two tails. Now, again, as we saw before, these tails are hydrocarbons, carbons, hydrogens, so they're hydrophobic. And then at the top, we've got our polar head. So our polar region is going to be hydrophilic. Do you see how you can bind the water up here, but water's going to say, uh-uh, I'm going to go up here. So you can have a portion that's philic, a portion that's phobic, and we call it amphipathic. Amphipathic. And it's going to be the nature of this molecule and the fact that we create two layers of these molecules both having the tails, the hydrophobic tails pointing toward each other, that creates the selective permeable nature of our plasma membranes or the membranes of our organelles. So here we see that double layer of phospholipids. Another way you're going to often hear membranes described is a lipid what layer? Bilayer. Lipid bilayer. And I wish they would really say phospholipid bilayer because it's more than just lipids. Lipids are fats. Phospholipid is a lipid with that phosphate charged polar group on top of it. So you see all of the yellow. Those are our polar heads of our phospholipids. There are fatty acid chains on the inside. Can you see our Oreo cookie now? Okay. But with this, our Oreo cookie, it's got some extra stuff stuck in throughout. So our, our membranes are not just phospholipids, but they can also be glycolipids. What, what's the prefix glyco? Have you ever heard of glyco or anything that sounds like glyco? Glycogen, glucose, sugars. You hear glyco, that's carbohydrates, that's sugars. So here our polar group on our lipids is a sugar group, which is polar. So it's going to be hydrophilic. We have some other proteins that are stuck throughout here. Proteins that act as receptors. Proteins that act as um, adhesive molecules to help hang on to other cells or other molecules outside the cell. Proteins that form channels through which material can pass in and out of the cell. Proteins do so much on the cell surface. We have a ton. And then we have this other group that are called sterols. Have you ever heard of sterol before? I bet you have heard of the particular sterol that's present in animal cell membranes. The sterols in animal cells and animal membranes goes by the name, which we don't really like, cholesterol. Cholesterol's bad, right? Not all cholesterol. You got the good and the bad. In physiology, we'll learn about the HDLs and the LDLs, the good versus 
the bad. So with our membranes, because of our fatty acid chains all pointing inside, the cream of our Oreo cookie, that's the hydrophobic center. That's the best part of the cookie, right? Okay, seriously, how many people do not eat the middle of the Oreo first? Be honest. You don't, you don't open it and eat the... You have... What? If I have milk, I will. If I, if, I, if I can dunk, I eat the whole cookie. If I don't have milk, it's got to be the... And I'll usually stack up the cookies pretty high before I even think about eating them. Do they sell just the jar or the cream filling? Because I would just get a spoon. Would that be the bomb? Oh. What? They do that. That is so gross. Really? They actually, what they do is that they have the Oreos and then they have the filling. Can you tell I have a cholesterol problem? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, but it tastes so good. Well, the inside, hydrophobic. All the polar chains. And with all of those hydrocarbon chains on the inside, most polar molecules... Any charged ions, positive or negative, sodium chloride, it's it's not just going to pass through there. The only way we're going to transport these kinds of molecules through is by having a protein channel that can regulate that passage. Because our proteins, we're going to see our amino acids are very diverse. They can be polar, they can be charged, and they could create a tunnel through our phospholipid layers, creating maybe a charged passageway. And in fact, what's really cool, we have some proteins that create channels that have a very specific charge that allows water to flow through. They're called aquaporins. Isn't that a cool name? Pores for water to pass. That's going to be one of the specific purposes and points of our proteins for the transport of molecules that, sink, that just can't simply pass on their own. So we talked about carbons, we talked about water. Now we're going to start again to get more complex as we put these into larger and larger compounds and molecules, not the least of which are going to be our proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. But there's a very sort of general and generalized way in how these components come together to make these biologically important molecules. And it's their assembly. And when you start out considering this, it it makes sense and it's it's fairly straightforward. So we're going to start simple and build our complexity. So here are molecules, nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and sugars. And we're going to see that the plan is about the same. You start with certain nucleotides. Think of them like pearls on a necklace. And you just string them together into this string of nucleic acids, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. Here you have amino acids. You string them together in a chain, and you've got a protein. For our lipids, you string those carbons together into hydrocarbon chains. Again, you put eight of them together. What do you got? Gasoline, octane. And for our sugars, you can start with one carbohydrate molecule, glucose for instance. And you can string glucose and glucose and glucose and glucose together until you get this long string called a polysaccharide that can be stored in your body. It's called glycogen. Or plants store it and we call it starch. So how we take these individual components and assemble them into these larger molecules is called polymerization. So we take individual units, which we call monomers, mono meaning one, and we assemble them into longer chains, longer molecules that we call polymers, poly meaning many. You see where we get that terminology now? So generically speaking, how do we take monomers and make polymers? The first way we're going to see that this happens is by a process called condensation. Now, when you think of condensation, what's the first molecule that comes to your mind? Water. Water. That's why we call it that. We're going to take two monomers. We're going to use enzymes to link them together with a covalent bond. 
But the first thing we have to do before we get them together is to form a molecule of water. We have to take some oxygen and hydrogen away from these two monomers so we can link them together. So the condensation reaction, two monomers join together in a bond which liberates a molecule of water. That's the condensation reaction. We're going to see that in almost every one of our assemblies, whether it's nucleic acid, protein, carbohydrates. Here in our example, that's, that's carbohydrate. That's glucose and glucose, and we're forming this long chain that's spiraling. That's starch. That's how you make starch. You see the molecule of water popping away? Every time you link one together, poop, that's a condensation reaction. Water's liberated. Now, the other cool thing about these types of reactions is they're going to be directional. And we're going to see that's important, particularly with our nucleic acids, with our proteins. There's going to be a directionality. You can't get these things backwards. You can't get them mixed up. And that's going to allow us to put them in the right order, in the right sequence, end to end, and never get flipped around. Because the molecules are going to have different shapes on each end. So that's part of the assembly process. Here again, we have another sort of illustration. You may be a person that likes words, you know, outlines, flow charts. That will be great. I'm a picture person. Have you figured that out yet? <laughs> and I like animations, too. That helps me understand how things are moving. So our list before that show the process, if that helps you learn nucleotides to nucleic acids, amino acids to proteins, great. Or you can look here. Proteins, they're monomers, amino acids, nucleic acids, nucleotides, polysaccharides come from monosaccharide, meaning the term for sugar. This, this is pretty interesting because when, when I think about proteins, I think about structure, I think about transport, but I don't really consider protein as a store of information. Now, nucleic acid, we know that our DNA stores information, right? The genetic code. But what, what is the code? What's the code used for? And don't say everything. That would be what my 17-year-olds would say. Everything. It's like, okay, yes, but more specifically, what is the DNA code used for? To build proteins and to build proteins in the right order. How do you order the amino acids, the monomers of protein? That's going to be directed by the code in the DNA. So the DNA code encodes for the specific arrangement of amino acids into our proteins. So in that sense, indirectly, proteins, yeah, they're informational molecules. And when they're big, we call them macromolecules. You, you can take some cells out of your cheek. And I don't know, you may do this in genetics down the road. But you can take the cells out of your cheek. You can extract the DNA in the lab. And you can actually see your own DNA as these strands. It kind of looks like snotty stuff. But you're like, wow, that's DNA? I can actually see it? It's a lot of DNA, not just one strand. But that gets at the point of, yeah, these things are big. Yes, I, that's a great way to say it. Without the proteins, you would never have blonde hair. I would never have blue eyes. I mean, you, you simply wouldn't. So you can understand the genetic code, which a lot of people are trying to do. And in fact, I read this article about how, I don't think it's a group affiliated with the FBI, but one of those groups has developed a computer program that can take someone's DNA run it through this computerized algorithm set, and it generates what this person might look like. Just from a little bit of DNA, maybe left at a scene of a crime. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Only because the DNA encodes for the proteins that lead to the traits, the phenotype. So I, th I think they can get pretty close. I don't know, it's kind of scary too, but eh, again, Kind of cool in a way. So 
When we look at our macromolecules, and we've already touched on this a little bit, storage and structural. Storage, for us, we use glucose for energy. We use other molecules, but primarily glucose is the way we go. And so for us, we take our glucose and we polymerize it, we assemble it together in this storage molecule, in our liver storage molecule, in our muscles, where we're going to need it. It's like stacking firewood. And that's called glycogen. Plants, again, store a starch. But you do realize that sugars can be used as structural molecules too. And in fact, carbohydrates are the most abundant macromolecule on the planet. Because when you link glucose together in a specific way, you produce a macromolecule called cellulose. Where do you find cellulose? Trees, plants. Think about all the plants out there. You can also take glucose and assemble it in a slightly different configuration, and you get this molecule called chitin. Where do you find chitin? Huh? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Close. You, you do have some chitin possibly in the cell wall of bacteria. That's going to be some cellulose as well. Yeah. Cockroaches. Yeah, the exoskeleton of insects is composed of chitin. Now, I've seen people that eat insects. I'm going to have to be my... You know, to think, well, it's glucose. I'm like, yeah, but it's a bug. Now, chocolate covered? Probably, because I like my chocolate. But yeah, chitin, insect exoskeletons, carbohydrate, cellulose, these big humongous redwoods out in California, supported by sugars, supported by glucose, cellulose. So again, structural in nature, just sugars. Now, the last little bit of this whole self-assembly talk, we have other things that are going on in our bodies, and proteins... They're not generated as they're going to be their finished product right when they come off a ribosome. Sometimes I think of proteins almost like a lump of clay. Have you seen uh, uh, an artist take a lump of clay and convert it into this just amazing sculpture by taking off some pieces and molding and shaping? Your proteins happen that way a lot. And some of your proteins can actually fold and shape on their own to a certain degree but then you have these proteins that are called molecular chaperones. And these molecular chaperones can bind to those proteins, keep them in a certain folded state, so that when they're processed or cut or clipped, then they become this normal, fully functional molecule. Have you ever made snowflakes out of a piece of paper? You have to fold that paper. If you just take that sheet of paper and you're going to cut it freehand, you don't want to see my snowflake if I'm trying to, because nothing's going to be symmetrical, right? So think of the molecular chaperones as these protein precursor molecules that help fold the proteins that have self-assembled into the right orientation to be processed into that fully functional protein that looks the way it's supposed to look. Break time.